Hi, I'm Steve Clements, and I have a question. Why have American evangelicals become Israel's strongest backers? Let's get to the bottom line. Throughout the war in Gaza and for decades before that, American evangelicals have been some of the most powerful voices for Israel. And that's saying a lot. 30% of Americans describe themselves as evangelicals. Conservative Christians are the backbone of the Republican Party's support for Israel, and they drive the national debates on abortion, on immigration, on education, and even race. They believe that God made a promise to the Jewish people designating Palestine as their homeland, and they see the creation of Israel in 1948 as a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. This idea known as Christian Zionism can be traced back for centuries. So with all the weight that conservative Christians have in the U.S., how much of these ideas are driving American policy on the Middle East? And is the catastrophic war waged by Israel over the past few months in Gaza sparking a debate among Christian churches in the country? Today we're talking with Jonathan Katab, co-founder of the Palestinian human rights group al Haq, board member of Bethlehem Bible College, and author of Beyond the Two-State Solution. Jonathan, thanks so much for joining us. I have to admit, this terrain is one that I don't often talk about, which is, you know, the religious dimensions of conflict and national interest. Tell us what we should know about Christian Zionism. Well, Christian Zionism is, is an old phenomenon. Uh, and there are different kinds of Christian Zionists, but the broad uh, thread that connects them all together is a, uh, a political position on Zionism in Israel based on some interpretations of scripture. Uh, some of them are really far out. Uh, some of them believe that it's the duty of Christians to support Israel uh, because that helps the Jesus come back again, the second coming. It's tied into their interpretation of prophecies and end times. You may have heard about the Left Behind series or the late great planet Earth. Uh, these are very popular, sensationalized uh, expressions of Christian Zionism uh, that says that the end of the world is near. Uh, the creation of the state of Israel is a harbinger of the second coming of Christ. And that somehow Christians are supposed to support uh, this uh, state of Israel uh, as, as part of God's plan uh, for the world. Now, not all Christian Zionists believe that. What, do, what they do believe is that somehow it's the duty of Christians to support the ingathering of the Jews uh, and to support the state of Israel. Uh, they take one uh, verse in uh, Scripture in uh, Genesis where uh, God says uh, to Abraham, uh, I will bless those who bless thee and curse those who curse thee. Through your seed will all the nations of the world be blessed. So people say we need the blessing. We want the blessing. Uh, so we want to support the state of Israel because that's the way to obtain God's blessing. Uh, the problem, of course, is that this is a totally false interpretation of Scripture because the New Testament says that the seed of Israel is used in the singular, who is Christ. It is through Christ that all the nations of the world are blessed, and not through Netanyahu or the state of Israel. I find it interesting because I think this is a certain strain of the evangelical movement that, has, has, that, that talks about the conflict that's unfolded today almost in holy war terms, which we haven't seen with political power, but this does have political power. Yes, this is really a very fascinating thing. Uh, and it doesn't only apply to Christian Zionists. Uh, the State of Israel and the Zionist movement has actually sought the support of well-known anti-Semites, as long as they are politically in their corner, like uh, Hungary's Orban, for example, um, like President Trump. Uh, people who are bigoted, anti-Semitic, who hate Jews, but who are willing to support the state of Israel are welcomed by Netanyahu and his ilk. And John Hagee is a perfect example. Uh, in his theology, he's actually very anti-Semitic. 
At one time he says God doesn't even answer the prayers of Jews. Uh, but but th this uh, strange political wedding uh, between anti-Semites and the Zionist movement is also uh, available for Christian Zionists. Uh, you can you can hate Jews. You can think that they are, uh, you know, God is going to curse them. Uh, very recently, I heard about a uh, pastor in a big mega church. Uh, we were trying to ask them to pray for the children of Gaza. And he says, no, 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 I don't want to do that. I don't want us to create trouble because, you see, I believe in the prophecy. All these Jews are going to gather there. And then with a big smirk on his face says, they're all going to die because Armageddon, they're all going to be destroyed except for those who accept Jesus Christ as their savior. So this guy who really doesn't like Jews, who thinks they're all going to be destroyed, is still going to politically support Zionism in the state of Israel, not because he really loves Jews or cares about them, uh, but because uh, it, it fits in his uh, twisted theology. Well, I want to ask you in a moment, Jonathan, about Hamas's ideology, just to, you know, be fair and talk about different corners of this equation. But um, another puzzle piece in this, confusing for me anyway, is that the ambassador of Israel to the United Nations, Gilad um, Erdogan, actually went to the Cornerstone Church, went to um, Texas, where, where John Hagee is based and um, uh, Christians United for Israel are, are, are based. And, and he made the following statement. He says, Hamas ideology is the same as that of ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and the Ayatollah regime in Iran. Does it worry you to see a leading statesman from Israel serving in the United Nations allied with uh, John Hagee and this uh, Christians United for Israel? Well, uh, let's be very clear. I am not an apologist for Hamas. Uh, their uh, philosophy, their ideology is Islamicist. But it's a much more mild form of Islamicist. It's certainly not ISIS. Uh, they certainly like the appeal of religion. And I think one must realize that with the failure of Arab nationalism throughout the Middle East, uh, there is greater uh, interest in an Islamic uh, form of politics. But Islam is such a broad uh, spectrum. It's, it's like Christianity. Uh, you can be a Christian Marxist. You can be a Christian uh, Sufi. You can be a Christian mystic. You can be a Christian liberal or a Christian conservative or a Christian radical. So Islam is a very broad uh, thing. It's not monolithic. And frankly, uh, at least the people that I know uh, from Hamas are uh, quite mild, quite moderate, quite, uh, uh, some of them are progressive. There are some crazies, of course, uh, but, but then you find that in every religion and in every political movement. Uh, I think uh, the Hamas leaders have made it clear that they are willing to accept a sort of long-term hudna with Israel, that they are willing to work with uh, the PLO and the Fatah and the nationalists. Uh, they are uh, more religious in their uh, political doctrine, uh, but, but they're not crazy fundamentalists. Uh, they certainly are not uh, like ISIS. And they have been very protective, actually, of the tiny uh, Christian minority in Gaza uh, throughout the years. A lot of the rise of Hamas was because people were very disgruntled with Fatah and the Palestinian Authority, who are very corrupt and inefficient at best. And at worst, they were serving the occupation and collaborating with it and sort of controlling its people uh, as subcontractors for the Israeli occupation. So, of course, people would reject that uh, and, and, and would, would go to lean towards uh, a more religious uh, outcome. And, and you have to understand, uh, people in Palestine and throughout the Middle East are religious. But it's a mild kind of religion. It's a deep faith that ultimately God is in control. 
Uh, you see people living in calamities and raising their hands up and says, God, look what's happening to us. We look to you for salvation. Uh, so there is always going to be a religious component uh, to people's uh, views on politics and everything else. The question is, what kind of religion? Is it a moderate or is it an intolerant, fanatical uh, religion? Uh, and and my at least my own uh, experience with Hamas that it's a rather moderate uh, form of uh, Islam. Uh, it's it's like almost like the Muslim Brotherhood uh, rather than like ISIS. I'm not saying the Christian Zionist group in America is all power, powerful, but it does have power. The the U.S. Um, embassy in Israel did move from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, in part because of this movement. So there is muscle there. And I'm interested in your study of this group and to what degree they see Palestine in, in a future that may be more just, more fair to both sides, frankly. Well, the Christian Zionist movement doesn't at all deal with the Palestinians. Uh, uh, for them, the Palestinians are either non-existent or they're the enemies of God because they're the enemies of the state of Israel. Uh, I find that the appeal for Christian Zionism is very broad, but it's very thin. It's not very deep. It's not as fundamental to their identity as issues like abortion, for example, or homosexuality. For them, support for Israel is like a default position that they haven't thought much about because they were never really asked or questioned or challenged on it. It's, it's, it's a default position. My, my uh, interaction with Christian Zionists has been that they, they are very shallow. They don't really know the facts. For them, it's just a given that Israel, because they read about Israel in the Bible, and they equate the Israel of the Bible with the modern-day state of Israel. They equate the Palestinians with the Philistines that were being, frankly, ethnically cleansed uh, by the Hebrew tribes in the Old Testament. They sort of jump over 2,000 years of history, and they jump over most of the New Testament. So that when you sit with them and to talk to them and you quote the Bible to them, uh, they, they are very liable to change their positions. But you have to talk to them in biblical terms. You have to quote scripture to them. You can't quote to them international law. What do they care? You can't quote to them uh, the dangers of World War III. They say, bring it on. That's the end times. That's uh, the second coming. That's wonderful. Uh, you have to talk to them about Christ's love, Christ's compassion, uh, Christ being the Prince of Peace, uh, Christ being open to everybody. Uh, to salvation, for God so loved the world, not just the Jewish tribe, that he gave his only begotten son. So whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. When you talk in that language to many uh, Christian Zionists, they say, hmm, we never thought about that. Maybe you're right. Maybe there is room for us to talk and to discuss. Uh, the problem is that most people who who oppose Christian Zionism, uh, don't use that language. Instead, they say, you know, you're crazy. You, you, uh, we can't live our lives. We can't run our politics based on what you say because it's destructive. And they say, okay, destructive it is. This is what we believe. This is what the Bible teaches. Uh, God said it. I believe it. That settles it. Right. What is your sense, Jonathan, of how much this may affect President Biden's view of the situation? You know, Biden is not a Christian Zionist. He is a Catholic Christian who is a believer in Zionism, but we should not merge those two together. But how do you feel Joe Biden is influenced by this conservative Christian framing? I think less so than, for example, somebody like Michael Pence or Pompeo from the old administration. They were evangelicals and they were Christian Zionists. Uh, I think Biden is more of a politician, 
Uh, I don't think his Christian faith really is involved too much in, in, in his politics. He is a Catholic, as you uh, mentioned, and the Pope has been very clear uh, about what uh, the Bible, what Christians uh, really need to do about uh, the current crisis in Gaza. Uh, so I'm not, I don't think uh, uh, Biden is himself a uh, Christian Zionist. You find more Christian Zionists among white evangelicals uh, who tend to be more Republican uh, than Democratic. So Christian Zionism is a phenomenon more closely allied with the Republican right-wing uh, politicians. Uh, but, but there are people who are manipulative. These are politicians. They don't really care. They don't really believe. That's not what motivates them. Rather, it's interests. One of the reminders to, for many Americans and many around the world that there are Palestinian Christians was a horrible incident in which a mother and daughter um, were shot by um, Israeli snipers while they were seeking refuge in a church uh, in Gaza. Would love to hear about Palestinian Christians and their view of this, their differences with the American Christian community, if there are. I mean, I'd love to kind of see where they are on the map. How important are they in this equation right now, which is, which is horrible, but they are there. You're one of them. Well, Palestinian Christians have always been an integral part of the Palestinian national movement. Uh, from the days of George Habash to the days of uh, George Antonius, even before that, one of the creators of the pan-Arab nationalist movement. Uh, so, so Christians have always been part of the Palestinian nationalist movement, uh, both because of their commitment as Palestinians, but also because of their uh, belief in separation of church and state. Uh, we say, الدين لله والوطن للجميع. The homeland belongs to everybody, but my religion belongs to God. It's between me and God. What will it take uh, with your work and others to elevate the notion that nonviolent movements, nonviolent protest and resistance may be a better answer while we're in the you know, horrors of war right now? I think what it takes is a few victories. Uh, Palestinians generally are not a very militant people. We have very militant vocabulary. We talk uh, blood and guts and power and and rifles, but actually most of the Palestinian political movement from the 30s to this day has been boycotts, uh, appeals to the United Nations, protests, organizing, negotiations, alternative forms, hunger strikes for prisoners. Most of our activism has been nonviolent, but it has not used a nonviolent rhetoric. We have used a very violent rhetoric, armed struggle. The gun will speak. Uh, no voice shall be raised above the voice of the gun. Uh, but but in, in, in actual practice, we haven't been uh, very violent in our struggle with uh, Zionism. We have been largely nonviolent, but we haven't used the rhetoric, the language of nonviolence. I mean, until the BDS movement which sort of in an organized fashion uh, tried to use nonviolence. But we've had the great march of return in Gaza. We have almost daily activities of nonviolence in the West Bank, protests, strikes, uh, hunger strikes, fasting, raising slogans, uh, raising the flag, even getting shot for raising the flag. Uh, working on human rights, documentation. Uh, we have been uh, very active in nonviolence, but we haven't usually used the language of nonviolence. We, we have used the language of armed struggle, uh, sometimes very bloody violent. We, we will make the ground burn under the feet of the occupiers. Very violent language. 
uh, but but our activities have been largely nonviolent. What does your gut tell you about where this conflict is going? Well, see, two things happened on October 7. One of them was military. The attacks of Hamas were first military. They breached the wall. They attacked soldiers. They attacked military install installations. They took over a number of army bases. Uh, they killed about 300 soldiers and captured many. That was a military operation. Nobody talks about it. They also attacked civilians and took civilians hostages. That was wrong. That was a war crime in many cases. Taking hostages, civilian hostages, uh, was, was illegal under international law. Everybody concentrates on that portion of what happened in October 7, uh, rather than the military aspects. And, and I think many Palestinians were fascinated with the military aspects. Here comes a group that actually breached the wall. We tried nonviolently to approach the wall, and the snipers killed 62 of us in one day. 62 unarmed Palestinians walking towards the wall were each killed by snipers in one day. Uh, so that uh, people uh, were attracted to the military uh, aspects of armed struggle, which Hamas illustrated, that even under the very difficult circumstances of siege, uh, they were able to do something uh, militarily. Uh, so in that sense, it, it really helped uh, shift the balance of power, which was so totally in favor of Israel, uh, it, it, it created a little bit of a, uh, uh, I wouldn't say parity, but a little bit, it shrunk the gap between Palestinians and Israelis. On the other hand, it really increased the fears and the traumas of Israelis. Uh, and so, th therefore, their reaction was just massive, uh, genocidal. I mean, they, they really went all out to try and recreate the deterrence. Uh, but they will never be able to succeed in that, in, in, in that aspect. Uh, they will never be able to restore uh, the deterrence, restore the element of fear. Uh, that's not going to happen. Well, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us. Palestinian human rights lawyer Jonathan Katab, co-founder of the Palestinian human rights group al Haq. Really appreciate your candor. Thank you very much. So what's the bottom line? Evangelical Christians are a major force in societies around the world, but the truth is they've helped supplant functioning multi-ethnic, multi-faith communities around the world with sectarian divisions and religion-infused intolerance. In Israel, the Jewish people have support of many evangelicals because of the role Jews play in the Old Testament of the Bible. They sort of see the Jewish people as part of their own story, and conservative Christianity brings their political strength to Israel's cause particularly today in this war on Gaza. There's just no doubt that religion is a driver on both sides of the Palestine-Israel issue and all political issues. But the aspects of tolerance and empathy that are part of all religions are getting drowned out by sectarianism and hate, the belief that one religion will ultimately prevail above the others. That's dangerous, and it makes it much harder to have discussions on how to bring justice and better lives to both Palestine and Israel. And that's the bottom line.